Production support for this episode of In Focus is provided by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to central and southern Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com and by WTIU members. Thank you. There's a competition for students in Indiana because the more students a district enrolls, the more money it gets. The state gives schools more than $4,000 per student. And to compete for that money, districts are doing things like adding academic programs and increasing bus services. We'll talk about whether the competition is increasing innovation or leaving some students behind as we put school choice in focus. And thanks for joining us on this edition of In Focus. I'm Kyle Stokes, education reporter for State Impact Indiana. In 2009, the state changed the way it funded schools. It went to a system where districts are awarded money based on the number of enrolled students. Schools used to receive the money based on the amount of property taxes collected in their district. As WTIU's Gretchen Frazee reports, some district officials say the new funding system is forcing them to compete with one another to retain and attract students. Students used to pay a transfer fee when they attended a school outside of their home district. That's no longer the case. Many schools have eliminated the transfer fee in an attempt to attract more students. School Choice Indiana Executive Director Lindsey Brown says students now have the ability to choose a school that best meets their needs without paying extra. The students who are doing well in their traditional public schools are not going to leave. That it's actually the, the students who are struggling or where it's not a good fit for them. Uh, those are the ones who typically take advantage of school choice programs. But Indiana Association of Public Schools Superintendents President Walter Burke says the change has also opened up a market for students. And that isn't necessarily a good thing. It may well get to the point that if a teacher finds the, uh, a great answer to a problem or working with a particular set of children, um, he, she is not going to share that news. Uh, the school principal is not going to share that news. The superintendent is not going to share that news because they want to win this game. One of the schools that's making changes to attract new students is Kokomo High School. The district added dorms with the hopes of attracting international students that would pay tuition. Kokomo Center School Superintendent Jeff Hoswald says that money helps the school increase its programs and makes it more attractive to students already living in the area. If we want to keep students, we have to continue to offer more and more things. And we realized that when we accepted these students, automatically allowed us to increase our number of AP classes by four. So we went from 13 to 17 AP classes. You won't find many high schools in Indiana that are offering 17 or more AP classes. Other schools around the state are taking less extreme measures, offering more extracurricular activities or increasing the amount of technology used in the classroom. And while Burke says school officials may differ on strategy, he thinks they all have the same goal. I think marketing is just another aspect, uh, but certainly superintendents across the state and school leaders and teachers, I think, still have the best interest of children in their hearts. Um, it, you know, we may have to do some things to be competitive, but uh, we still want children to be the focus of what we do, or I hope we wouldn't be here. As students return to school, parents will have to judge whether the district is serving the best interest of their children, and they'll have to weigh the costs and benefits of transferring schools. And we welcome you back into the studio to introduce you to tonight's panel. We are joined here in the studio tonight by Teresa Meredith, who is the vice president of the Indiana State Teachers Association. She's also a kindergarten teacher in Shelbyville. We also are joined by Dr. Tracy Cadell, who is the superintendent of Eastern Howard School Corporation, and by Bob Enlow, who is the president of the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Well, uh, Dr. Cadell, we might as well start with you because you heard about Kokomo schools in, in that opening piece of video that we played here. Uh, and uh, you are th the district that's, that's very close to them. And uh, to put it roughly, you are the competition, right? I mean, you're, uh, I, I understand that part of the competition is that you're sending in buses to, to Kokomo schools. And that's one of the things that's driving competition in Howard County. Uh, absolutely. We started this process uh, a couple of years ago, and, and we were the first school in Howard County to accept transfer tuition students. And since that time, uh, we have uh, 225 transfer students in our district, uh, including 136 students at our elementary school as of this morning. And uh, we are running two bus routes into Kokomo. 
uh, and potentially we'll be looking at a, at a third bus route. So uh, the, what is the reason behind sending the buses in? What, what kind of started the process? Well, we wanted to give every child an opportunity to attend our school district. We're a high-performing school district, and uh, we did not want to leave any child out. And so we thought it was really important to um, have transportation available for those parents who would not be able to send their children to our district without that service. Now, I, I want to send it over to you, Mr. Enlow, and bring you into this as well, because this is also kind of an interesting look at how school choice might be different than you might hear about it on the news or read about it in the newspaper. There isn't a charter school in Kokomo. There are private schools, but no voucher schools in Kokomo or in the Howard County area. This is another way that school choice is beginning to look in Indiana. Absolutely, and I was excited to hear what, what the superintendent said. I mean, he said, we're a high-performing district that are going out and getting parents to come to that district, and that's a great thing. We want more and more of that. The more that the focus can be on parents and what they need and deserve, the better it's going to be. Does it work both ways, Dr. Cadell, when uh, you hear Jeff Hoswald again in that opening piece talk about upping their AP course offerings and kind of bumping up academic offerings? D does that kind of return the pressure to you? Are you also feeling like you're, you're kind of in a position where you're competing with Kokomo, the, you know, well, that the competition goes both ways? It, it certainly does go both ways. We welcome the competition at uh, Eastern Howard. Uh, and it has, it has caused us to up our ante, you know. Starting tomorrow, we're going to uh, have an iPad initiative where every student K through nine is gonna have an iPad for home and school use. Uh, we have added Spanish K through 12 um, since competition developed. Uh, we've added a guidance counselor at our elementary school to help deal with uh, some of the free and redu reduced lunch issues that we see and so forth. So yes, it, it's definitely caused us to rethink our programming but I think it's healthy for schools. And Mrs. Meredith, just to bring you in on the conversation here, you're obviously one of the plaintiffs in the, uh, in the state's largest teachers union's lawsuit against the voucher program and, and have criticized, you know, the, the ISTA has criticized charter schools. We can talk about that in a second, but this is a very public school issue that we're seeing this kind of, of competition between public schools and that students are choosing where to go based on these offerings. What do you think of this? Well, I think it's, it's great to give parents an opportunity to find the school that really fits their child's needs within the public school system. You know, they're paying tax dollars and public schools are run on those tax dollars. I think the challenge comes in meeting the needs of a certain demographic of parents and it sounds like Dr. Cadell and his corporation is doing it right. They're trying to find a way to make the transfer opportunity available to any student who wishes to come and that's with meeting the needs of the transportation piece. Many times when you open up a school and allow any child to come, um, there's the challenge of transportation. The other piece is I think um, Dr. Cadell is doing it well in his school corporation with making sure that every student who comes is given the best opportunity to be there. Right now we are finding or hearing stories about students who are not given opportunities to go to another public school in their area because of a variety of issues. Um, so, so they're being screened as they apply and not necessarily being given and full opportunity. I noticed early in your answer you used the words in the public school system. Uh, this yes. is an argument we've heard from, from people with the ISTA before. Can you explain a little more what you mean by that? Well, sure. Uh, you know, the, the public school system is the system that is available to every single child in our state. And every single child in our state, their public school system should be set up to support the needs that they have. And the tax dollars should go to support that need. And when you look at uh, public school choice where I can choose, you know, I have four children and I can choose now to go to any of the public schools in my area or really anywhere that I'd like to send my children. It's just a matter of the lo logistics of if I can get them there and if they'll be accepted. Uh, because many schools do have a process by which they have people apply and they may be accepted or they may not be accepted. Mr. Enlow, do you think that there is this kind of exclusivity piece when you're talking about movement between public schools schools and uh, say a private school or a charter school that may not be present in a, in a situation where you're talking about transfers between two public schools. So we know that from the data, the latest data released, there's about 12,000 children who are now uh, going to public to public transfer and we're hearing more and more stories about uh, school districts not accepting kids or cherry picking or putting some sort of barrier to entry. 
That's not what we really want. We want all kids to receive public funds to go to any school type. That's really the goal of public education, not necessarily one school system. So what we're finding in the, in the school choice program, the voucher program, for example, the law was written so that there's a lottery for kids. If, it, if they're oversubscribed at the school, then they have to do a lottery, and, and that means everyone gets an equal chance to go in. And the great thing about the school choice program we know right now is 85% of the kids, the 4,000 that went last year, are free reduced price lunch. So it's giving opportunities to children to attend high-performing schools that they would not have had access to otherwise. Mm -hmm. Now, with students comes money. I mean, sort of tied up in your argument, Mr. Enlow, is that the way that funding of schools should work is that kind of, it was, it's been put to me, you put money in a kid's backpack, and wherever that backpack lands on the first day, it's, it's where that money goes. Uh, Dr. Cadell, I mean, this is something that I'm sure you can speak to. Uh, having this competition has certainly brought not only students, but it's also brought money into a district that, that had seen declining enrollments. Absolutely. Um, at Eastern Howard, the funding, it's about $1.2 million in additional funding, and we've not had to cut a single teacher or program during the recession. I would disagree on one issue, however, and that is the, the lottery system. And at Eastern, we do have an application process. However, we accept right at 95% of our students. There are occasions, however, though, where I have to disagree with a lottery, and, and that our primary goal is safety and security of students first. Before we can educate them, we have to make sure kids are safe. And there could be cases where kids are under significant suspension issues or have been expelled, and I think you need to take a look at that. Also, there could be extreme cases where you could have a student with very, very, very significant uh, disabilities, for example, where a school system has already hired a nurse or an instructional assistant, and you would not want to duplicate uh, those services would not be very efficient. We accept special education students. We have a number of, of, of special education students or transfer students, but I also think you have to be careful in saying you're going to accept every single student. Now, Dr. Enlow, when, when you talk about lotteries, you're talking about a system that's in place to make sure that you pick students at random if there are more students than you can take, and that's been put in place in the charter schools and the voucher schools, and, and it, I mean, should it be put in place in the public schools as well? Where, where do you think? Well, actually, I would agree with the superintendent here. I, I think in the 21st century, we should be at a place where we can match a student's needs with a school's ability to provide that needs. We, we shouldn't necessarily think of every school has to accept every single student. We should be thinking of what's best for the student and what school type is best for them as well. So frankly, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I don't think you should have to have a lottery. We should require our public funds to ensure that all children get an access to a publicly funded education. But beyond that, we should be working much more on school type matching. All right, I want to bring in a voice that uh, isn't sitting at this table into our discussion. Uh, and we have a piece of, of video from Matthew Stark, who's the principal of Brown County High School. And he talks about uh, trying to be able to choose and, and what, how public schools should be able to uh, respond to that competition. Um, you know, the ability for uh, parents and families to choose now is, is probably greater now in their state than it's ever been. And it's my belief, and obviously I'm biased at, here at this high school, but fine, bring it. I mean, let's go. I mean, let's compete. I, we, I think we do a great job. I think there's a lot of really great things going on. Ms. Meredith, do you think that this is the right attitude for public schools to take? Let's embrace this competition. Let's lean into the fact that we now have these charters, vouchers, as well as transfers between public schools. Well, I think it gives our schools a chance to, to really celebrate and showcase what they do well and to give educators an opportunity to step up and say, you know, we are really good at meeting this particular need. I really like the, the idea of, of trying to match a student and a school with the right programs. My concern comes in, however, where um, when, it's, when it's open and there is some sort of a, a process by which you select groups of students that you find situations like we are sort of looking at now. Um, in the coming years, I think if, if something isn't done, we're going to see even more of it. For example, a school um, looking out for um, an athletic program, going out and re recruiting students specifically for an athletic program, or on the academic end, going out and looking just for those students who are on the highest end and bringing them in. 
Um, you know, I, I, I'm very concerned about using taxpayer dollars that should be in the classroom with having to put out a media campaign and a media blitz to, to make sure folks are aware of the programs that are going on within their schools. Is there a place for that? Perhaps a small place, but I really hate to see those dollars being spent away from students. On the other hand, this is kind of the landscape now. We've got these vouchers. We've got these charter schools. We've got a whole bunch of different options. And isn't that just kind of part of the new normal? And, and why is it that, that we can't move on with this new normal and try and compete on this, on this new playing field? Well, I think you know it, it opens up a lot of questions we've never really talked about before. Um, is it sometimes what I tell my children at home is sometimes just because something can be done doesn't make it right. And I think using taxpayer dollars to work within the tax paying system and the public school system really is what's best for our children because it makes it available to every single child. When you start looking at a private school or a religious school, there's a different element there. Um, particularly in the religious schools, there's, there is the, the faith vein and um, that, that's a concern. Um, in that that's woven into the instruction. I used to teach in a parochial school, I know that. Um, and, and then the, um, the piece of, of the voucher perhaps not meeting the full, the full cost of the tuition for that family or that voucher not covering things like transportation. Even within the public school piece, when you're looking at students going to different corporations, even though they're public schools, there are still financial challenges. Dr. Cadell and I were just talking about that prior to the, to the show, about the transportation piece and how important that is to his school system that that not be an issue for a child who wants to come to his school. So I think we have to begin looking at the public school services and once we figure that system out, then decide if we should be looking further at the private or at the private and parochial schools. Dr. Enlow, I mean, I, th I think that no matter how many arguments you make about whether or not you have what the benefits or the drawbacks of a charter or a voucher system, having other options outside the traditional public school system, it's still going to just rub people the wrong way to send public dollars to private institutions, especially religious institutions. Well, so first of all, in the state of Indiana, we do that all over the place. We spend a lot of public dollars to go to private entities. Uh, and a number of higher education institutions, uh, health and hospitals, a number of instances. What we really want is taxpayer dollars to go to quality schools, uh, regardless of school type, right? This should not be an argument about what type of school is the best, but what, what quality of the school is the best. And we should be driving those public dollars to make sure they're working because we have spent a lot of time in Indiana and across the country trying to reform the system from within. And the competitive uh, responses that are happening now are only a step in the right direction to improve it faster. I want to take a part of that answer, quality, and bring in yet another voice to the conversation. Uh, we spoke to John Elsesser, who is the executive director of the Indiana Non-Public Education Association, and he had something to say about quality as well in non-traditional public offering schools. You know, I think in any free market environment, whether you're talking business or education, I think quality and providing quality over time uh, has a lot to do with the viability of any business or organization. So I think uh, people hopefully will be choosing those quality options. And if there are non-quality providers out there, whether that be in the public sector, the non-public sector, the charter sector, uh, you may see that people don't select those. And if they don't select them, I would think over time they would no longer be in existence. Now, it's, it sounds like a compelling argument. Try and send money to the places where there's quality. What we've also seen in the research and that what experts from across the spectrum have told me is that it's not clear that parents are choosing based on quality, Mr. Enloe. I mean, do you think that we can truly count on the money going to the quality and the students flocking to the quality as well? So the great thing about the Indiana program is that if they're not going to a school that meets the state standards, because all the private schools that are participating in the scholarship program have to take the state test and get graded A to F. And what we did with the program is to make sure if those schools aren't uh, performing over a time, they lose their money. So in four years' time, if a non-public school is not performing up to standard, if they're getting an F or a D after four years' time, they're going to lose their money. That's unlike any other school. It's more accountable than any other school type in the country. And of course, I'll beg to differ with you on the research. The research is actually pretty clear about school quality. If you look at the random assignment studies of children who receive vouchers in Milwaukee and D.C. and other places, they are getting a better quality education 
education for what their needs are. Uh, so we know the research is showing it's working for students. We know the public schools are responding. We also know that taxpayers are saving money. In Indiana, for example, uh, sorry to bring in Eastern Howard County, but you guys got $5,000 as a distribution from the voucher program. And, and all the school districts got a distribution from the savings. And so we're glad to actually see the voucher program benefiting public schools that way. Ms. Meredith, what do you think about that, benefiting public schools? Well, I, I, I think we still have to look, if we really are wanting good quality public schools, we have to look at what issues are coming up in the schools in the neighborhoods, and if the neighborhood school isn't up to par, then we need to see what we need to do to make that public school a great public school with, with top-notch teachers and, and, and excellent programs for the students that it serves. The best schools are the ones who meet the need of a community, and a community many times thrives on and around a school. Um, and, and so I, I still would argue that you have to look at the public school, do whatever is possible to make that public school a great place because that's where a majority of the students in that community are going to go. They're going to end up there and it is our, I think it's our responsibility as citizens to make sure that that school is a great place, a safe place where students can go and grow and learn without worry about if they can afford the transportation or without worry about if it's going to be closed tomorrow. Dr. Cadell, I, I mean, we talk about, you know, your numbers as well, uh, but really I think that it's probably clear that in most of the state, at least in the rural areas of the state, places like Kokomo don't have charter schools and, and uh, voucher schools, Correct. as we mentioned before, and you've seen a great infl influx of students as a result of this. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that you're seeing uh, people come into your schools? Well, I think because we've been very, very successful. Um, we have a tradition of excellence at Eastern. We had the third... I'm sorry, the second highest third grade I read scores in the state. We have uh, Howard County's only uh, elementary orchestra. We have Spanish at the elementary school. Uh, we're iPad initiative, which I've already mentioned. We also have some uh, preschool options in terms of we started a program called Dolly Parton Imagination Library, which actually came out of Tennessee, where all of our, our, all of our children uh, at the preschool level receive age appropriate books. So when they come to school, they have a personal library of 60 books. And that's the one thing I think I do disagree about with respect to the voucher program as it exists so far, and that I still don't think we've done enough in Indiana to help public schools with, with quality preschool education, um, as well as full, fully funded kindergarten. We have a kindergarten grant for the second half of the, of the day, but it is not a fully funded kindergarten program. And so until those things happen, I would still probably oppose vouchers. Dr. Enlow, I wonder if this brings up kind of a broader issue. I mean, you hear the, the pre-K argument a lot. It, it also kind of touches on some of the, the, the broader criticisms of moving to something like charters and choice as a means of correcting the public education system, when maybe the answer, some would argue, is not in choice, but in actually fixing the broader societal issues of poverty and, and doing it through programs like pre-K, as well as things outside of the education sector altogether. So we've had a number of programs in our traditional public school system to try and alleviate the impact of poverty, Title I and other programs. They have simply not worked over time. And we have come to the conclusion in our organization, I think around the country as well, and the po polls are very clear about that the public is uh, agreeing with this as well. And that is, if you can't fix it fast enough, you need to give options to get, you need to have parents have options. Parents need to be able to get out and move to a place that works for them. And yes, do I think that the state has a responsibility to, to work with pre-K and K? Absolutely. But that needs, again, we need to stop having the conversation about school type and start talking all about school quality. And that's the most important where public dollars need to go. It needs to go to quality school providers regardless of the type they are. And should we fund it more? That's absolutely fine with me as long as we're accountable for the results we're getting. At this point in our evolution into this new school choice filled landscape, it seems like there are a lot of problems when you're talking about a very small amount of students that are leaving a school corporation. I mean, $16 million, I think, was the amount in the voucher program last sure. year. Now that I'm not going to tell a superintendent that that's not a small <laughs> amount of money, but at the same time, we're not talking about a big enough amount of money that a public school would shut down a building. Sure. Um, so they're left in this really kind of tough spot. Can you appreciate that? But yeah, oh, absolutely. Sure I do. But but look at the impact already that the uh, the 4,000 voucher kids, the 30,000 charter kids, and now the 12,000 public to public transfers, just that small number of students is having on the system as a whole. It really is shaking things up and getting people to think about schooling in a different way. And so I think that's an investment of $16 million. It's well worth it. Remember, we're spending, 50, we're spending half of our state budget on K-12 education. 
Ms. Meredith, do you think it is worth it? Well, I think if you take that money and you really invest it in the public school system, our public system school system would be amazing if we really believed in the concept of a great public school for every child and I, there are you know Dr. Cadell mentioned the preschool piece or the kindergarten piece it's difficult to have a full day kindergarten program that isn't fully funded to really do it right and then before that even there are societal issues that even you mentioned that we could begin to address and perhaps uh, uh, perhaps help in the preschool program a preschool or pre-k setting but I'm hearing Dr. Enlo chime in already with the argument you hear so much that there is no proof that more money makes a difference. I think if you look at the programs that the school is offering and decide what needs to be fixed, then you can reevaluate, reassess the situation with the finances. If there is n a need for more money to be put into a specific program to meet the needs of a child, then by all means, it needs to be considered. It needs to be considered. I, I want to bring in Dr. Cadell, and there's a different kind of angle of this question that I'm really interested in that, that you probably have to deal with when one of the districts where you're going in and actively recruiting students is Kokomo Center Schools. If you compare the I-STEP scores of your district versus Kokomo Center Schools, you're talking about a district in Kokomo Center that has lower I-STEP scores, and you're pulling students out of an environment where, I, I mean, if the I-STEP scores are any indication, sure. you could argue that the academic quality is at a lower level. I, I mean, you know, that argument about whether or not testing is a good way of, of assessing academic quality aside, you're getting those students into your school district, and now that doesn't help your bottom line, which in a lot of ways is test scores, right? Oh, I, I think if, if a student comes to Eastern, uh, we will make sure that, that we get them to where they need to be. Uh, we took three years uh, and have planned for, for transfer tuition students and we've added things uh, like three reading recovery teachers at the elementary, we've added a reading specialist at the middle school, uh, we have added a couple literacy coaches because the key at Eastern is literacy. We believe in the literacy K through 12. It's hard to uh, do biology if you can't read the book. And so we have really pushed that literacy component as well as you know the Dolly Parton which I mentioned um, we've added the guidance counselor, so we've taken steps to try to address as many needs as we can. And uh, we think any student that's a Comet's going to be successful. Mr. Enlow, I mean, this, this question of test scores is important because you compare things like charter schools and voucher schools. You know, the numbers don't always match up when you compare charters broadly to public schools broadly. I mean, public schools still perform a little bit better. Um, private, schools perform, or private schools perform a little bit better than public schools. I, I mean, when do you think we should start to see an impact in test scores on that choice side? So I think we're already seeing an impact of, on the test scores. So uh, in the voucher schools, 93% passed iRead. 90% uh, of the schools, the schools who were voucher schools passed uh, ELA in math. So we're seeing the voucher schools doing a very good job of performing. And we want to see that competitive impact. We are, we've already seen that, by the way. Since 2009, when the money st started going down, you've now seen an increase in test scores despite a lowering of the money. All right. I'm going to have to make that our last word. Uh, I want to give our thanks to our panel of guests for joining us here this evening for In Focus. And that is our show for this evening. We have continuing coverage of these issues on State Impact Indiana, which is a collaboration of Indiana's public broadcasting stations and NPR. We cover education policy. And you can find the blog on our website, indianapublicmedia.org. And while you're there, leave a comment or see portions of this broadcast at indianapublicmedia.org slash in focus. And send us your questions for next month's show. Email them to infocus at indiana.edu. Thanks also to all of you for watching and listening. Have a great night. Production support for this episode of In Focus is provided by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to central and southern Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.